today. All right. So welcome, Jesse from Helion. Is that how you say it? Yep. Helion Energy. Um, I'll just turn it over to you and you can kind of introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background. So some people are going to be unmuting and asking questions along the way or putting it in the chat either way. Um, and so welcome. I'm glad you're here. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning. I am Jesse. I'm the director of communications at Helion. And I already see there is a very robust discussion going on in the chat around fusion. Um, so I'm hopeful that means that we are off to a good start in knowing kind of what Helion is and what fusion is. But to make sure we're all on the same page, I've got a couple of slides, if you don't mind, that I'm going to share and talk a little bit about what Helion is, leave some room for discussion around Helion. But then I'm going to talk specifically about my path to being the director of communications at Helion. One really important thing to note is that uh, Helion is a pretty deep engineering and science company. So there's going to be a lot of STEM language and conversation around STEM, but I don't come from a STEM background at all. So I'm hopeful that we can all come to this from a pretty lay, uh, level playing field and uh, have a really good discussion. That works for you guys. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. to get us started. Now, how does that look over there? Is that just the main slide for you? Great. Okay, so as I said, I am Jesse, the Director of Communications at Helion, and Helion is a fusion power company located in Everett. We were founded in 2013. Uh, for a long time, we were in Redmond, and, and about 15 months ago now, we, we moved to Everett. We have a team of 180 team members, and there's some really fun stuff about our technology specifically that um, has helped it become really successful. We were the first privately funded fusion company to reach 100 million degree Celsius plasma temperatures. This is 10 times hotter than the sun. And the reason that that's important be is because we are a, a fusion company in order to do as much fusion as possible. We really want to make plasmas super hot. So this is a really big thing for us. And it allowed us to raise $500 million on top of an additional $77 million we already had. Um, and now today that has allowed us, that amount of money is allowing us to build a fusion machine that we can commercialize. So we're at a really exciting point in our technology development and uh, that lets allows us to get closer to commercialization. Are, you, are you on the seventh version? Is that yeah, right? Yeah, so we're on the seventh prototype, which we call Polaris. Um, so before now we've built six prototypes. It was our sixth prototype that reached 100 million degrees Celsius temperatures. And the one that we're building now, we're building it specifically to demonstrate that you can create electricity from fusion. Something that I think is missed a lot is that energy and electricity get interchanged, but those are two different things. And so we're trying to not just create a lot of energy, we're actually trying to capture that energy in a way that's useful on the grid. So that's what Polaris is doing, and we're building that right now. The picture you see here is of the first section being completed on Polaris. Um, now we have two sections of Polaris complete. There's five sections in total, sort of kind of depending on how you count. So we're at the point now where we're getting close to having a machine, which is really exciting. And if I look outside my door, I can see it being built. So it's very cool to, to work in a place like this. So I know that there was some discussion happening um, in the chat, but real quick before I move to the next slide, I, I've mentioned the word fusion and said that we're a fusion company. Can you guys type into the chat a quick definition of what fusion is? All right, so I am seeing it's the goal, isn't the goal cold fusion? Not quite. Uh, fusion is fusing together atoms when atoms combine to create energy, when the atoms combine and make big energy, releasing energy, combining, fusing. Yes, 
everyone is right here. So fusion is the process of combining two atoms together to create energy in the process. Um, I don't know if you guys have had the chance to read or, or come across the equation E equals mc squared yet, but E equals mc squared is that famous equation from Albert Einstein that says that energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. And what that tells us about fusion specifically is that when those two atoms, we know that when two atoms combine, there is a release of some mass in the process. So some mass basically goes missing when they combine. And that means that some energy is released in that process. Ultimately, we see this every day when we look up, hopefully not directly at the sun, but especially at night, if we look up and see the stars, each of those uh, light sources are using fusion to create energy. Fundamentally, all of the energy that we have on Earth comes from fusion in some way, because if the sun wasn't shining, we wouldn't have ener any energy, right? So the, the real thing that we can think about is that fusion is the process of the stars at a really quick high level. But the reason that this is interesting from an energy standpoint is that fusion offers a clean, reliable, and abundant energy source. It's clean because it doesn't produce any carbon, unlike fossil fuels, and it doesn't have any long-lived waste. Right as I was joining, I saw someone say something about uh, fusion being extremely radioactive, and I want to make sure that I make this really clear right now. Fusion is very different from fission. So nuclear fission, which is a common power source that we might all be familiar with, um, has a lot of conversation about nuclear waste. And nuclear waste from a fission power plant uh, has a radioactive lifetime up to tens of thousands of years. So the reason that's a big part of discussion around nuclear fission power plants is because we have to think about storage uh, specifically for the waste. For fusion, there is some radioactive waste, but it's radioactive waste is, it has a half-life of 12 and a half years. So a much different time scale and a much different lifespan. And the way that we can store that is, is much easier. It's also really important to note that the amount of waste that's produced from a fusion plant in the time scale of a year is extremely small. So it's very easy. It's not easy. Uh, it's something that we need to take really seriously, but it's something that we can uh, control and keep very safe. So yes, radioactive, but not radioactive how we might think of radioactivity. Fusion is reliable. It has no risk of a meltdown. So in nuclear fission, you have a chain reaction where things are, uh, neutrons are continuing to break atoms apart. In fusion, it's totally op opposite. Fusion is atoms coming together. And in order for the reaction to keep going, you have to keep giving it fuel or keep the system under vacuum. So as soon as you turn it off, it just stops because there's no chain reaction which means that we can really rely on this being a safe uh, power source. And finally, fusion is abundant. The fuel for fusion comes from fresh water or salt water, wherever you get your water. In us, in our bodies, we have about two years worth of fusion fuel just because we have water in our body. I just think that's hilarious. And the amount of fusion fuel that you need is so small. So the, I have a picture of a bottle there, but I also have a picture of a, or I have this bottle here. This bottle has a gram of fusion fuel in it, and it has enough energy to power a home for over a year, and it's equivalent to 10 tons of coal. So this is a very clean, reliable, and abundant energy source, which is why scientists have been working on creating this source for us on Earth. Now, there are lots of ways to do fusion. I'm just going to quickly touch on how Helion does fusion by showing you this video. So we have a machine that looks kind of like a, two cones facing in, and we create plasmas in the machine. On each end, they get put into this donut shape, and then magnets, so if you look here, these are a bunch of magnets, they turn on and they push these plasmas into the middle of our machine where they get pressed by extremely strong magnets until atoms combine and fusion occurs. This releases some energy in the process. And the really cool thing about this is that energy release can be directly recaptured as electricity 
through a change in magnetic flux, which induces a current into the coil. So it kind of bypasses, it bypasses the steam cycle and it allows us to really efficiently get electricity from fusion, which I think is really beautiful. So from here, um, I am going to stop quickly because I'm sure that there are a couple of questions about fusion and helion, but I only wanna take about five minutes to answer those, answer those and then I'll step into kind of what I do in my job and how I got here. So if you have any questions about Helion, feel free to drop them in the chat. All right, so I'm seeing from Shrey, it's still a bad idea to be around an operating nuclear reactor. Yeah, probably don't do that for lots of reasons. In our case, we have a lot of high voltage electronics. So being around those can be a really dangerous thing because arcing can happen. Um, and if you were to touch anything that was high voltage, it would likely kill you because there's so much electricity, just like if you were to touch a power line that was down. It's also not good to be around an operating generator because fusion produces neutrons and neutrons are a, um, they are something that can cause things to be radioactive. So during operations, our facility is closed. No people can be in there and we have lots of safeguards in place to make sure that our machine doesn't operate while anyone is near. So that's a good clarification, Shrey. If you want superpowers, David, I don't know if Fusion is the place to go, but I've heard that getting a good college degree is a really great way to do that, and it can give you superpowers. Dylan so asks, what atoms are you fusing? This is a really great question. So we fuse an isotope of hydrogen called deuterium and an isotope of helium called helium-3. So hydrogen, one uh, proton, one electron, normally. Uh, deuterium is one proton, one electron, and then we've got an extra neutron attached to it. So it doesn't really change what it's like. It just changes its weight a little bit. Um, and there's enough deuterium in all of our oceans to power the world for more than a billion years. It's just, it's a really abundant isotope of hydrogen. It's very safe. Um, helium-3, on the other hand, is a lot harder to come by. People have for a long time have talked about mining helium-3 on the moon because it is not very abundant on Earth. However, if you fuse deuterium atoms, you actually make helium-3 as a byproduct. So that's how we are getting our helium-3. Helium-3, by the way, um, isotope of helium. Normally, helium has two protons, two neutrons, two electrons. Helium-3 drops one of those neutrons, so it's a little bit lighter than normal helium. Uh, Sahana, so you asked, what do you do about thermal pollution from the water? I'm not sure if I understand that question, so if you want to clarify that, maybe try asking in another way. Annabelle, when do you think these fusion machines could be sold commercially? Really great question. So Helion is pretty far along in its progress, and we actually just signed the first ever power purchase agreement. So an agreement to buy electricity from our machines. Um, and this was an agreement signed by Microsoft. And our goal with Microsoft is to put our first fusion generator on the grid in 2028 and provide them electricity. So five years. After that, we'll sell hopefully more and more electricity from those generators. Avishi, you asked, what's the worst chemicals you've mixed? How long does it take to be fused? Uh, worst chemicals, not really sure if I understand that question, um, but how long does it take to be fused? It happens in less than one one thousandth of a second. So our machine, I just played that video, this video, it pulses and that pulse all happens in less than one one thousandth of a second. So it's very fast. You can barely see it sometimes. Uh, Shrey says, I think they use carbon and nitrogen as they arc relatively, are they're relatively stable elements. I think we clarified that, deuterium, helium-3. Um, let's go. Avishi asks, does this require more physics or chemistry? Would you recommend taking any of these classes if you're interested in the field? Um, generally, fusion is going to fall more under physics or engineering. So a physics is going to be if you want to be a scientist working on the theory behind the problem, physics is a good route to go. 
Chemistry is a little harder to make the jump into fusion, um, but there are applications for chemistry. So we have some chemists that work specifically on materials. So if I said our, our plasma gets to 100 million degrees, you might ask, what can hold a plasma that, that, that's that hot? So we think a lot about the materials that surround the vacuum vessel to ensure that we are limiting um, activation, so neutron activation from the, the reactions, um, and then also degradation over time. So what materials are strong enough to withhold these fusion reactions repeatedly? Um, has a prototype produced energy? If so, how much energy? Dylan asks. Uh, so our six fusion prototype um, hit 100 million degrees. We haven't talked very much externally about how much energy it produced. So again, right now, our goal for our seventh prototype is to show electricity production, and we're planning to have that fully built at the beginning of next year. So I would kind of keep an eye open for next year. All right, I'm gonna ask you, uh, answer two more questions and then we can get to more at the end. So that way we can move on to the next part of the presentation. Um, so does it pulse incredibly rapidly or something? Quinton asks, yes. So our six prototype uh, pulsed once every 10 minutes, just to do some tests. The prototype we're building now will pulse every once every 10 seconds. And further along in the commercial development, we expect it to be pulsing at once per, per second or faster. So it will pulse pretty quickly. Um, and then last one that I will answer is, have you recently tried to power a home for a little longer than over a year recently? Is a question from Faith. No. So at this point, we are still developing the technology to put on the grid. So 2028, that power purchase agreement with Microsoft will be the first time that we put power onto the grid. So I am going to pause here and move on. Thanks for all the great questions. And hopefully we have more time at the end to go through those. So like I said, I am not an engineer. I'm not a physicist. Um, I do communications. So my whole background is in communications. And what that means, at a fusion company like Helion, um, it can kind of be broken into lots of different buckets. But for here, I wanted to focus on three specifically. So I focus on branding, media relations, and community outreach. Um, so branding is all of the things that makes a company look like what it looks like. So for a lot of companies, the first thing you'll see is a logo, um, but there's a lot more to it than that. If we think of McDonald's, for instance, they have a very clear logo that we all know, but they also have all of the other surrounding things like they have Ronald McDonald as a mascot. They just did like a whole campaign saying goodbye to Grimace, right? And the goodbye Grimace campaign was part of their branding because they have these characters that they sometimes use. Um, it's the packaging that they put um, a, with all of their food. So for Helion, the branding is what our logo looks like. It's what our website looks like. It's what our pictures are whenever we're, we're posting anything or other people see what we do. It should look and feel like Helion. So the machine that you just saw, that animation on the last slide, is a piece of branding for us. We want to show what our machine does and what it looks like, so we, we keep it to looking and feeling like Helion. So that's one thing that I do. Another thing that I do is media relations, which has a lot of pieces to it. So um, historically, media relations would be working with journalists to talk about news that you have. Um, helping our team do interviews with those journalists. So this could be journalists at the Seattle Times. It could be journalists at these trade publications in Washington, D.C. It could be working with reporters from the New York Times. It could be working with TV reporters. There's a lot of different types of journalists that you might work with. And in the changing media landscape now, a big part of this comes down to influencers. So I work with a lot of influencers to help tell our story. The picture that you see here is actually from an interview that our CEO did with the channel Real Engineering, if any of you have seen that channel on YouTube. Um, they came out to our facility in December last year, or August last year, to make a video, and they posted it in December, and that's a really big way that a lot of people learned about Helion for the first time, because they had a pretty, Real Engineering has a pretty big following. 
And then finally, another piece of what I do is community outreach. So uh, when Helion does sponsorships uh, or whenever our team goes and talks to maybe community groups like I'm doing right now, I help coordinate with the right people and right stakeholders from our team to show them like, this is a group that you should go talk to because you have this experience and you have this passion outside of work and it really is a good way to blend the two together. So ultimately, I feel like my goal is to build relationships with external stakeholders to showcase our mission beyond our facilities doors. So that's a bit about what I do now, but now I want to talk about how I got here. So I've got some old pictures of me on here. Um, so I grew up in Southwest Missouri in the Ozarks, and I uh, graduated with pretty good grades from high school. I had a 4.3 GPA, um, so I took a lot of AP courses, which is how I had a higher than 4.0. Um, and I say that because I really, I liked school. I want to make that clear that I did enjoy going to school and I know not everybody does, but for me, it was something I really enjoyed doing. But the reason I enjoyed it is because I really loved sports. And in order to be on the team, you had to have good grades. And I felt like it was a good balance for me. So I uh, played volleyball, ran cross country, uh, ran track and played basketball. And that was really like what was important to me. And I graduated from high school really unsure of what kind of job I wanted, really what I wanted to do at all. I have this picture on here because this was one of my really good friends um, from high school. And we were, we were the ones who gave our high school graduation speech. And I say that because I think that segues into eventually going into communications where you do a lot of talking in front of people. Um, so there was probably something there that was flagging like, oh, you kind of like communications and uh, talking, uh, doing public events. Um, but again, didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I did through sports, get a scholarship to go to a university near where I was from. So I went on a cross country and track scholarship, which was really big for me. I didn't really know how I was gonna uh, get to college and what I was gonna do there, but cross country and track really opened the door for me there. I still got good grades, um, but when I originally started at uh, at college, I went in thinking I was going to be a political studies major. I quickly realized that I just wasn't really interested in that. So I'd spent a semester doing that and then a semester without a degree in mind. And then I fell into a couple of writing classes and a couple of communications courses that I really enjoyed and thought, I think this is the thing that I want to do. And I did those alongside a minor in business administration in Spanish. So with communications, I was also getting more of like the business side of stuff. So you get, you know, lessons in economics, accounting, marketing, which kind of help you prepare for what you might be doing in the, the business world a bit. And then Spanish, I wish I used it, but I don't really use it anymore. Um, but it was really fun minor to get, and it allowed me to study abroad. So I appreciate that and occasionally get to help someone in an airport when I can tell that they are maybe a bit lost. Um, but after undergraduate, I still wasn't totally sure of what job I was going to do, but I had an opportunity to do, to do a contract position for two years that allowed me to travel and see the country. And I went to my undergrad really close to where I grew up um, and went to high school. And so I think this job for me was a really good way to travel around the U.S., see the rest of the country. And ultimately, it made me want to go back to grad school. Um, and I set me on a path to do that. I think by having two years away from school made me feel really ready to go back and dive in in another capacity with a little bit more experience under my belt. So then I went to grad school uh, at Purdue University, which is in Indiana. And again, I still got good grades, still enjoyed school, still did sports. I was in the cycling club, uh, but then I ended up getting my master's in communications. And that was really done through a grant that I got from Rolls-Royce to do some, some communications training with Rolls-Royce, which is headquartered in Indianapolis. And by doing that research position with Rolls-Royce, I learned that I really loved communications in the corporate setting and I wanted to 
go into industry, as academics will talk about either going into academia or going into industry. I chose to go into industry. And then I applied for jobs um, in Seattle because I really wanted to move to Seattle. It was mid COVID. So I really was applying to anything I could get my hands on. And uh, I ended up getting a call back from this company called Helion that I've never heard of before. And turns out they do fusion, which I don't even know what that is. And then uh, in through that interview process, I realized that what this company is doing and what they're after, what their mission is, was really incredible and something I wanted to be a part of. So I joined the team as a communications lead. And here I work with the executive team to set the brand strategy. And now I am the director of communications after two and a half years or so. So that's a little bit of my path from high school to where I am today. And I think the, the full thing here is through the last, you know, decade or more for me, um, even when I didn't totally know where I was going, I kept moving forward in some way. And I think that it's really important to know that it's okay if you don't 100% know what you want to do, but you should have some sort of like light in front of you that says, you know what, no matter what, I want to do this. So even though I didn't know after high school exactly what kind of job I wanted, I did know that I wanted to get an education. So I went to school and got that education in some way. And I think along the way, I've set these little flags ahead of myself uh, to go get, even if I don't know 100% what's going to be next. So that would be my advice. And I think the thing that's helped guide me, um, guide me the most and got me to where I am today. And if you would have asked me 10 years ago, uh, if I would be a communications person at a fusion company. I think I would have a lot of questions. So I'm glad that I didn't set the clear path for myself at that time. I, I think I think that's vital, especially to these guys as high school students, because they they get so much pressure. Like, what are you going to be when you grow up? What are you going to be when you grow up? And I would say probably, as I teach mostly during the regular school year, juniors and seniors. Um, I would say probably 80% of them have no idea, you know, what they want to be when they grow up. And so it it is just, you know, moving forward, realizing what, you know, maybe what you're good at, what you're interested in. Do you, do you want to be um, at talking to people? Do you want to be working on a computer? Do you want to be moving around active? Do you want a little bit of both, a little bit of everything? And those things thinking about what that, you know, career area, those kind of jobs entail kind of helps you. And then I love that you said you just kind of happened into some classes in college that really defined and really drew you in. And I think, I think that happens to a lot of people, you know, mm -hmm. that you start college and you have to declare a major and you're going to do this. And then you get into it and you're like, hmm, I don't know if this is really for me. And then you kind of, but as you take classes, something clicks and, and you go with it. And so I want everybody to realize that it's okay. If you don't know, you guys are 14, 15 years old. It's okay. Uh, rarely do people know when they're that age, what they're going to do in life. Maybe you're really drawn to the medical field and People think I'm going to be a nurse. I'm going to be a doctor. But there are so many other things you can do in the medical field. Maybe you're not good in medical field kind of classes, you know, things like chemistry and biology and, and but you really are drawn to that field. And so there's so many other things that you can get into, but be in that industry. So that I appreciate you kind of sharing that part that it's okay you know, you started one way, you changed, something caught your attention, you went another direction, and then you just kind of put put it out into the universe and started applying for different things. And every experience that you have kind of moves you forward. And it's just mm -hmm. that moving forward and keep searching for what it is. I appreciate that. Yeah, I think you made a really good point about like, what are things that are intrinsic to you? So for me, I am an extrovert. I love talking to people. So if I had a job where I wasn't allowed to talk to people, 
probably wouldn't last for very long. And like, that's a really easy thing. Like, if I don't totally know what I want to do, but I want to do things where I'm with people, then a way that I could keep moving forward is not just going to school, but maybe volunteering and doing community events. Like that's a piece of that. And maybe I find something there, but kind of keeping that North star for you of, I want to do something with people. That's always helpful. Yeah. Okay, well, that is a lot of talking from me. And I apologize if I talked too fast or was so uninteresting that you're now asleep, but I'm hopeful that you're not. Um, but I think we have some time now and I'm happy to answer more questions about myself and how I got into my career as a comms person. Quick question, is there anybody who's interested in communications or even marketing or design, anything like that in this group? Maybe. I don't, I think that um, in high school here, in our high schools in Everett, I don't know what classes you would take if you're interested in communications, we do have like marketing, like mm -hmm. business and marketing classes and, you know, organizations like um, DECA that mm -hmm. um, kind of give you competitions related to, you know, business and um, creating businesses or even speaking or role playing and things like that. Yeah. Uh, but I don't yeah, know about other classes. So I don't think we, at my high school, we didn't have communications courses either, but we did have a marketing class and we did do DECA mm -hmm. and I loved DECA. We only offered it our senior year, but I had so much fun. I did um, automotive sales marketing. I got to national. So I got to go to Anaheim. Again, I'm like a girl from the Ozarks. So it was my first time going to California. Got to go to Disneyland. I thought it was so fun. Um, we had that, and then we also had a public speaking course, which might be another thing that if you're interested in communications, a lot of times public speaking is involved or training people to do public speaking. So if you have a chance to do that. And then other than that, communications, I feel like you can learn a lot from your English courses because it's a lot of reading and writing, um, or even a lot of uh, communications has to do with government stuff. So like policy and keeping on top of the news. So even taking uh, like government classes can also be a bit helpful just to shape the worldview. Yeah, our seniors, this, um, yeah. our seniors take government, a government class is required. It's now called civics, it used to be mm -hmm. called government, and it changed to yeah. civics this last year. And so um, they do that as a senior. And then they, of course, as a sophomore, they take world history, and then they take US history as a mm -hmm junior yeah um, but there are ap you know related to that um ap u.s history we have to have a um ethnic studies class um you know that has some of that but we, i don't feel i don't know if we even have speech um classes there's lots of classes that incorporate that you know you need to do a yeah. presentation things like that and some people are really into that and some people it freaks them out yeah so. often a lot of like undergraduate schools in your freshman year you'll have to take a public speaking class that's pretty common so even if you don't get it in high school you might get a quick glimpse into it in your freshman year of college oh yeah regini says eight we have a class called ap seminar and we have one called ap research mm. that are kind of um connected together and so those are uh um, great classes to take related to communications mm -hmm. yeah so harneet you asked me what ap classes i took during all four years of high school so i took uh ap world history probably the hardest class i've ever taken ap world history very hard um, I'm not a history person, I should say. I took um, AP government, I took AP calculus, and then I took, I think we only, oh, AP English. And I think that might've been the only AP classes my school offered. We didn't have a lot of AP courses. And then I also took a college level trigonometry class, which was offered through like one of those programs where you get some college credit while you're taking it in high school. Um, Heidi, you asked that about my studies abroad. I can tell you more about that. So I uh, did a minor in Spanish. So for a summer between my sophomore and junior year of college, I lived in Spain 
in a small, small ish town called Valladolid, which is about an hour outside of Madrid. And the um, it was a really great experience for me because it my I, I lived with a host family who didn't speak English, so it really just meant that my Spanish got very good over a summer, which I loved. I love the Spanish language, and I loved Spain. I loved being in a small little town where you walk everywhere and you have a siesta from two to five every day, and you eat dinner at ten thirty p.m. I it was just the best. Loved it. Um, Avishi, you asked, how did you manage not to overload yourself or exhaust yourself with all of those AP classes? So I think from, I had listed four, I think four classes. So world history, I think was in its own semester. And then I, oh, I also took AP ceramics. That was like a, so like pottery class, um, which you had to do a portfolio for, but I wish I had better advice for this um, on not exhausting myself, but I think for me, because I played sports, I had very limited time to like do my homework and really focus on school stuff. And for me, the limited time actually helped me really be very um, focused. So if I only had two hours to do homework between school and a game, it meant that I needed to study. I couldn't be focusing on other stuff and I was very good with structure. So for me, that was what was really helpful. Um, and then we also at my school offered like a study period and I study period could either be for studying or hanging out with friends. And I did prioritize, like if I don't have my homework done and I know I have a game tonight, like I need to actually use this period to do my homework rather than hang out with friends. Um, but I can't say that I remember feeling totally overloaded in high school, if I'm being completely honest. So I'm not maybe the best person to answer that one. Um, does a AVID help with public speaking when taking it, talking about the communications path? That's a, that's a, AVID is a, an optional course that students can take um, that really focuses on um, study skills and planning for college. And usually mm -hmm. as juniors and seniors, they might go on college visits and stuff. And so um, I'm not that familiar with AVID um, Faith, but uh, um, I know that it is a, it's a great class to take um, for all kinds of kind of setting you up for success for after high school, um, if especially if you're on a college path. And so if you're wanting to go to college, it will absolutely help you and open your eyes to what's out there, learning about what degree programs are at various high schools. <laughs> um, so AVID is talk to your AVID teacher at your school. Are there any other questions for me? Oh, Regini has her hand up. Um, in high school, did you have any like interest in like science classes or tech technology classes, or did you just like stumble upon Helion? I, funny enough, really didn't like science in high school. Um, I like I was always very good at science. Um, I remember my eighth grade year, our, each class like picks the best student of the course. And I remember getting the like student of the year for, I think it was biology. It must've been biology. And I remember thinking, I don't even like this class. I don't really understand why I'm getting this award, but okay. And then um, biology went into earth science, went into another biology class. And then I think I, I took physics at the first chance I could instead of chemistry, actually, because I really liked math, but I didn't really like the, I didn't really like the biology and earth science courses. I say this because this has completely shifted. And now, like in my free time, I basically just read like science books um, and try to make up for lost time whenever I wasn't interested in science, because now I love science. Um, but I, yeah, just, I think I didn't find science as challenging as I wanted it to be, or like reading for me, 
reading wasn't difficult, but I liked that you could interpret things and really try to parse stuff out rather than there just being a correct answer. I think generally I was like pretty good at memorizing and I felt like science was a lot of memorizing and I didn't, I didn't really find that interesting at the time. Again, now that's totally changed. Um, I am almost upset with myself that I felt that way in high school because I think I could have learned a lot more. Um, physics specifically for my school was more focused on like the engineering side of stuff. So like we built bridges, we did a lot of um, like uh, math based uh, modeling of the world basically. Um, so it wasn't like, I don't think we learned about fusion in that course. Um, but then my my partner is an aerodynamics engineer, so he is super into uh, science and engineering. I think through him, I've learned a lot over the last six years or so. And then when I was at Purdue, Purdue is a pretty engineering school. So all of my friends that I would cycle with were engineers. So I think just kind of through time, I've come back to love science. Now, outside of fusion and learning about fusion, which I really love being an area for me, um, I really like to learn about neuroscience. So I read a lot of books about the brain and um, like how and why humans operate the way that they do. So I came back to science eventually, but I, I did not, I wasn't overly excited about science classes in high school. Any other questions? Anybody want to unmute and ask a question? Or put it in the chat? Um, Oakley did share that our AVID classes have a lot of opportunities for public speaking within the class, like um, being able to either talk in front of small groups or in front of your classmates, um, things like that. And so I know at Everett High, we have like, well, each school has like several different AVID teachers that teach different grade levels. So um, Harneet has a question in the chat. Yeah, so Harneet, you asked, you're interested in communications and STEM. So what field of study would you think would be a good combination of both? Honestly, I think if you are interested in STEM and communications, I would take STEM courses. And then I would really focus on when you're doing reports for that to figure out how you can bring in really good writing into those reports. So focus on the writing aspect of it while you're doing that. And then in college, if you're interested and have the time to, I would recommend getting a minor in communications or a minor in business administration. I think both of those can help kind of bridge that gap. If you're interested in a specific part of communications, so communications for me, um, I did like study. So I studied communication theory actually. So kind of like research behind why people communicate the way that they do, um, which now translates into my applied communications. Um, but there's other pieces of this, like you can do multimedia broadcasting, so like video creation. Um, you can do studies, so like theory, and then you can also do specifically like a PR track where you learn how to do public relations. Um, so you could get a minor in one of those or double major. Um, it's going to be hard to find a class specific to that. I will say I had a class in college that was called, um, it was called... I don't remember the exact name of the course, but it was about communicating science ethically. So it was kind of like an ethics class about science specifically, but it was a communications course. So it was how do you like communicate science in a way that is good for the world. Um, and I really appreciated that class, but I think that was a kind of special class for my school, but you might be on the lookout for those types of things. I think some people, some people like when you say, oh, I've got a degree in communications or that's what I want to do, we automatically think like broadcast newscaster, I'm going to be on the news mm -hmm. as a news reporter kind of person, um, which a lot, you know, that's what most of those people have their background in. But yeah. I like how you know, we're seeing communications doesn't mean that you have to be on TV on the news, you know, because yeah. all different types of companies need people who 
communicate to the public, who communicate to the news media, who communicate on via the website, who whatever it is. And so, um, and we actually have another person that we'll be talking to next week that is uh, got the same communications kind of background, but she works at Northwest um, Innovation Resource um, Center Lab in um, at the Angel of the Winds Arena. Mm -hmm. Um, and so she's, she has a different kind of take on how her communications background, you know, got to where she is today. So, yeah, I think communications is often an under, uh, a misunderstood field. I think people assign what communications is, and that's usually maybe kind of close or a piece of communications, but it's usually a lot broader than that. I think what's really fun about communications is that you end up being kind of a consultant within your company to a lot of different people. So I have engineers coming to ask me, hey, I want to send the team this report about a recent experiment that we did. How can we say this in a way that every, all 200 employees can understand? And we have a, you know, a mix of employees. We have physicists, but we also have uh, people who work in human resources, for instance. And so like that type of thing is really fun um, and is a probably a thing that people don't think about when they're thinking about communications. Um, Sahana, I see that you said what other opportunities are there in the communication field. Um, so again, at my school, we were offered three tracks. Um, theory, which really is, and this is originally what I wanted to do was I wanted to be a communications professor. So this is like research, doing a lot of research about different pieces of communication. In grad school, my research was on uh, using big data. So I wrote, I, wrote, I wrote code in Python to scrape data from Twitter before you had to pay for uh, scraping data from Twitter, like you do now, um, to scrape data from Twitter and then find sentiment around specific things. I was in grad school during COVID, so I actually was getting uh, a bunch of tweets about two different documentaries. One was a misinformation documentary about COVID and one was just like a normal documentary to see how it was being propagated across the internet. Um, so I gathered for this research more than 20,000 tweets and then wrote a code to assess that and then wrote up a report about it. Um, so that's like how you can do communications theory and apply some STEM, which is kind of fun. Um, so you could go like professor route, you could also go into broadcasting, um, you could go into like video producing, script writing, that's all communications types things. Um, then there's public relations. So this is when you tend to be more media focused. Um, social media management, if you like doing social media and writing things for social media, that's a communications role. Um, and then there's also internal communications roles. So if you want to do communications just for the company. So like not external facing and just do like, if you worked at a company of 10,000 people, you need to keep all those people informed of the same thing. Um, so you usually have an internal communications person. Erica, you asked, what are some tips you have for public speaking? How do you become more comfortable with public speaking? Uh, this is uh, something hopefully if you get a chance in college, I 100% recommend taking a public speaking course. And those will give you a lot of tools on how to feel a little less anxious when you're doing public speaking. I think no matter how many times I speak in front of people, which I do quite a bit, I still get a little nervous because I feel like what if I said something silly or what if I said something completely wrong? That would probably be the thing I'd be most concerned about if just on the spot I couldn't remember what I wanted to say anymore and then uh, just said something completely inaccurate, especially in front of fusion people. Uh, I'm a non-fusion person often speaking in front of people who are interested in learning about fusion, often alongside physicists. So that's like a really nerve wracking time when it's like, oh, I'm coming with less knowledge than the people are next to me. The ways I would combat that is just by coming in with as much knowledge as I possibly can. And then also at the front end when I'm speaking, letting my audience know this is the background I'm coming with. So that way they can understand like, oh, if she doesn't know this thing, that's because she doesn't have that background. And I think that helps a little bit with me. And then outside of that, practicing, just a lot of practice. And I think even practicing in front of a mirror or recording yourself speaking will help you kind of get a feel for how you talk in front of people and has over time made me feel more comfortable with it. 
I remember um, when you spoke with our class last summer and you were fairly new um, to this position and you talked a little bit about that because you were like, you had to kind of do your own, you got the job and then you had to kind of Mm -hmm. learn the information. You could do what needed to be done, but um, the context that because working for a science company and not having a science background, you had to kind of train yourself and Mm -hmm. teach yourself. Um, and I, I can tell that you're just, you're even more comfortable this year in this position and you've got the terminology, you're saying thing, you know, it's like, you're, you're really, um, you know, it's, it's your identity. Now you can Mm -hmm. speak this, you know, walk the walk and talk the talk kind of thing. And, and it's probably very nerve wracking or, you know, questioning yourself, should I even take this job? Because I don't know anything about what they're doing, but you've shown that you've got this, you can, you're, you have to be a lifelong learner, no Mm -hmm. matter what it is, even as a teacher, sometimes we're asked to teach things that we, you know, they say you can teach, but you don't really have a background in and like mm-hmm. my background's in horticulture and floral design. And then they're like, you know, well, could you teach a turf grass management class? Technically, yes, but I know nothing about turf grass <laughs> management, you know, um, but that's what the state of Washington says I could teach, but who knows? Um, but you just have to continue to realize that n- school doesn't stop when you get your first mm-hmm. job. You're always learning. You're always needing to improve yourself. And it might be very specific to your job. Um, but you have to take that jump and go, yeah, I can do this and figure out what you need to know so that you can do the best you can. So I love that about just seeing you over this past year and being able to you know, you can talk science now, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, and I've put in the work for that. That's so true. Like I have read so many books. I read pretty much anything I can get my hands on about fusion. So it is certainly a part of my job is continuing to learn. And, be and it kind of, you build new passions, you know, mm-hmm. it probably was not a passion five years ago. And if, you know, like you said, if somebody had said, Hey, this is what you're going to be doing. You're like, no, not my passion, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, um, that's, that's cool. Yeah. Regina wants to know is HR communications. Does that fall under communications? No, not quite. So usually communications will fall under, a, it kind of falls into a lot of different boats, but usually it'll be its own track. Um, but the, uh, communications team will work really closely with the HR team on specific things. So uh, recruiting is a big one. So communications is kind of the, you know, how the branding happens. But if you are trying to recruit people, you need a really good brand. So we'll often work really closely with our recruiters to help make sure that we are putting good information out for the recruiters to use to recruit really good candidates. Do you think that um, like in college and and my students might not know this, but you've talked about, you know, majoring in communications and then minoring in other things. And um, mm-hmm. do you feel like communications does best as a major, the major focus of your college? Or like if you're interested in the science field, majoring in, you know, biology, but minoring in communications, wh- which do you feel like mm-hmm. works better? Yeah. So I took communications as a major, but then I also took some science classes, um, just how my university worked. You had to take a lot of classes across different fields because it was a, a liberal arts college. Um, but if you are interested in STEM and are thinking you want to go into a STEM field, I think I would still recommend doing a major in STEM and the thing that you're most interested in. And then doing a minor in communications will really you might not become an expert at the end of it, but over time, and I think this is a good thing to note about college, you have to buy textbooks. And honestly, if you buy those textbooks and you keep them after you graduate and you've taken a couple of classes in communications and maybe you don't remember everything because it wasn't your major, you have those textbooks. And when you go out into the world and get a job and you find a job that's kind of STEM and kind of kind of communications, you'll have like maybe three or four textbooks that you use during school that you can refer back to. Honestly, I kept a lot of my textbooks from college and I still use them. I've got a bookshelf behind me that you can probably see if I wave my hand a bit. 
most of them are from my college courses and I honestly do use them still, um, even though I've graduated oh, a while ago now. Awesome. Faith, you had your hand up a little while ago, but did you get your question answered? What were you wanting to know? We can't hear you, even though you're unmuted. Um, I was going to ask that yeah. since, since you're hard communications, which is like you're part of the branding and also advertising, like your company, what was like one of like the biggest like campaigns when promoting your like the, the source power when doing when trying to think about companies for commercializing the energy source, such as Microsoft? Yeah, so uh, we announced Microsoft. The Microsoft Power Purchase Agreement in May, and that effort probably like took three months to prep, and it was a matter of working with our, we work with a PR firm that helps us reach out to specific journalists, so what we did in that case was like, this is how we want to tell the story, so here's the press release that we're going to do, so write a press release, and then you uh, reach out to journalists that you think would be interested in the story, you organize a bunch of interviews around them, and then alongside that, we work with a bunch of other stakeholders. So not just media people, but like government people. Um, we'll work with NGOs, so non-government organizations to let them know like, hey, this is coming up. Um, and then alongside that, we build out a social media plan. So how are we going to get this out into the world on our own channels, not just from Helion, but from our company's thought leaders. Um, so there's like a lot of moving pieces. And I think all together for that announcement, we probably had four different pieces of the strategy that other people were like helping with. So it was like our PR firm doing one thing is the Microsoft uh, communications team doing one piece. It was our public affairs and government relations team doing another piece. And then it was our executive team doing another piece. So it's like kind of organizing all of that. Um, the biggest piece of that altogether, um, I would say we had, so we had 14 news outlets placed with journalists that we interviewed with. And I don't know which news story would have been the biggest hit for us, but we were in the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post. And I was really proud of that because those are two really big publications alongside The Hill, CNBC, uh, GeekWire, Axios, The Verge, there was lots of really good coverage on that. It's really, I mean, we think about, okay, you guys are right here in Everett, the Seattle metro area, but because, especially because Microsoft is a worldwide company um, and what you're doing is cutting edge information, um, the country needs to know about it. The world needs to know about it. It's not just our little local newspapers. These are mm -hmm. big name publications that um, people read all around the world, uh, not just in the, even in the United States. And so um, when you're doing, and, and so different companies are going to be, you know, be in different situations, but with Helion um, doing this fusion research, it's, it's a big deal for, for everybody it's not just a big deal for our community and so that's why you've had to pull in all of this other mm -hmm. you know people from around the country really yeah that's awesome all right i appreciate your time do you have any final words in encouraging words I, I just want to say thank you for letting me be here today and speak and if you have any questions feel free to send them to uh Tammy and she can email me afterward and I will be glad to follow up with with you either on the side or through Tammy however that is good luck with the rest of the summer enjoy it and then good luck with high school as you get through that you guys are going to be great all right thank you very much we appreciate it all right you guys so if you've joined us from the other class, um, you're welcome to leave now. And um, those of you in our class, we're going to take our 10 minute break. So let's take a minute stretch and, um, and then we'll get back and finish up class here. All right. 
I'll get our timer up here in just a moment.